Ethiopian rebels earlier this spring. More than 6,000 Ethiopians are trapped in the city's naval base and port area. Isolated by several hundred yards of open sands, it's almost impossible to break out. But the guerrillas have failed to overrun them for exactly the same reason. A battle that has already left more than 4,000 dead and wounded has become a stalemate. Do you like to watch them? Yeah, we see them all the time. <laughs> so what? We see them. <laughs> And we don't care until the final time that uh, we'll be ready to hit them. And we know we are going to hit them very hard. And you think that a Kalashnikov, a few grenades, and your determination is enough to overcome the obstacles, the Russian equipment, the tanks, the yes. artillery? Yes, it's, 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 it's the will of the man that, that fights uh, such kind of wars. It's not really the, the sophistication of the, of, the, of the weapons. In Eritrea, the armor is for show. Russia's support of Ethiopia has to date done little more than provide the guerrillas with some unexpected garnishing for their victory celebrations. And there have been plenty of those over the past few months. These Soviet tanks, some with less than 50 miles on the clock, are now part of the Eritrean's 1st Armoured Brigade. The guerrillas admit that they're unlikely to use them in battle, but what better for morale they add than to be able to parade them under the noses of the enemy. Extraordinary confidence and an admission of defeat, but not perhaps without good reason. The EPLF now has more than 30,000 fighters under arms. But the threat is all too apparent. For three months now, a Russian naval task force has been keeping the Ethiopians in Masawa alive and the guerrilla positions under regular bombardment. If it isn't from the ships, it's from the artillery and the planes. Their casual behavior appears to bear no relation to the reality outside, but that, they say, is the only way to survive. The city itself, however, has not. Ethiopia's most important outlet to the sea is under siege and in ruins, the rows of concrete and wooden houses shattered by the fighting. But it's in these buildings strung out across the city and around its edges that the EPLF hold their line, a warren of tunnels and trenches burrowed out of the damp sands of Masawa, within clear sight of the Ethiopians. <laughs> Railway sleepers provide a solid enough roof, but the preoccupation is not with the war. Four hours daily of grammar, maths, English and political education is compulsory. Their protection, a discipline that appears to maintain their morale under the most appalling conditions, is the leading of as normal a life as possible. 115 kilometers inland, 7,000 feet up, the Eritrean capital, Asmara, like Masawa, has been under siege since the beginning of this year. The EPLF refused to allow us to film their positions, but they're clearly dug in around the city in some strength. Despite the help of Soviet advisors and Cuban and South Yemeni troops, the Ethiopians were forced to retreat after nearly a week of heavy fighting. Still, the dead remain unburied, but the Eritreans are only too well aware of the response that their success will bring. from the Ethiopian's previous allies, American F-5s. From their new friends, Russian MiGs. This city of 250,000 people may be under siege, but it's rapidly being built into a formidable fortress. A Soviet airlift that involves 20 or more flights a day has been underway since last month. New armor, food and fuel for a garrison that now numbers some 20,000 men. But the guerrillas still manage to infiltrate behind the Ethiopian lines. How much are you able to operate inside Asnara itself? For example, in the past months uh, we were in need of a uh, film projector, you know, for the cultural show. So we went in uh, the cinema hall, the biggest one, and we just took it. We pillaged it. 
In the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. In the middle. In the daytime. In the daytime. Yeah, in the daytime. No such deception is needed in the Sudan. North, across the mountains and deserts, the supply lines of the Eritrean People's Liberation Front begin. Graham Greene would have it no other way. The colorful but somewhat conspiratorial atmosphere of this Red Sea port provides the perfect setting for a guerrilla operation. While largely dependent on its own resources, the EPLF is still forced to buy much of its basic food stocks, medicine and fuel from outside. Port Sudan is the headquarters of the Eritrean Relief Association. It handles no guns, just food, donated or bought with funds from Arab friends and trucked back across the deserts to Eritrea. How much of your supplies actually pass through the Sudan? Supplies which come for the Eritrean Relief Association Actually, most of it comes through the Sudan. Are there any restrictions imposed upon you by the Sudanese, or do they just turn a blind eye to what you're doing? Actually, I'm, uh, I wouldn't say they turn a blind eye. They know what we are doing. This is a humanitarian activity, so they really help us. It's the Ho Chi Minh Trail of the Horn, Liberation Road as the EPLF call it, 1,600 kilometers of rough hewn track built by hand over a period of four years, an improvised road system that's the backbone of their entire operation. More than a thousand lorries, nearly all of them captured from the Ethiopians, keep the supplies coming. They move mostly at night or under the cover of cloud. There is a constant threat of air raids, even in the more remote mountain areas. Scattered along its entire length is a network of repair shops, underground garages, and camouflage fuel dumps. Like nearly everything else, the generator is captured. The garage might appear makeshift, but it is, in fact, extremely efficient. Their assorted collection of Fiat's, Bedford's, Mercedes, American Mack trucks are regularly serviced. The spares are cannibalized or made on the spot. The mechanics work long hours, but are expected to fight as well. Where did you get this machine from? This machine just we took it from the liberated area of Masao. In the night time we go there and they will put it in our lorry by Mampar and we take it outside. Just like that? Just like this. So whenever you want uh, a modern machine lathe like this or any other equipment, you just mount an operation into one of the cities held by the Ethiopians and take it out? Yes, yes. It is perhaps the thoroughness of their organization that's been the key to their success. Hidden in the valleys, buried deep in the more inaccessible areas of Eritrea, a complex system of interlocking underground base camps, not just in support of the war, but as part of a behind-the-line civilian administration. The EPLF Information Department. Fighters rotated from the front, man the duplicators. In February alone, they produced four different political magazines, 500,000 bus tickets, 40 editions of their school textbooks, and the first water and electricity bills. Not a mile or so away, a typing school, currently training 10 new typists a week. And they have to learn to type in English and Arabic, as well as their own language, Tigrinya. And part of the same camp, a carpentry shop. It has 30 skilled carpenters, many of them taught after they joined the front. They repair and renovate rifles, again mostly captured. They also provide the hospitals with equipment, produce furniture, and with the help of the engineering department next door, have started to manufacture artificial limbs. 
Like everybody else in the support camps, they work from 6 to 11 in the morning and 4 to 7 in the afternoon and are expected to go through at least six months of military training first. It's during this period that the fighters receive what is considered to be the most essential part of their education. Be it Mao or Marx, the setting is African, a philosophy tailored to the needs of one of the poorest corners of the continent and the traditional demand for victory to the people. <laughs> Much colonial blood has been spilt in Eritrea. It was the British, helped by Sudanese and Indian troops, who drove out the Italians during the Second World War, who stormed the same Italian-built fort outside the city of Keren that the EPLF captured from the Ethiopians last year. For the Ethiopians, it was the loss of the second largest city in Eritrea and the end of their effective administration in the province. Ironically, the site of another Italian defeat was also the scene of an Ethiopian one only a few months after Keren. One hundred years ago, 500 Italians were killed around this hill. In December last year, 1,500 Ethiopians died here. Now it's the Ethiopians who are colonizing Eritrea, argues the EPLF. Certainly, there is much eyewitness evidence to support guerrilla claims of the killings of large numbers of men, women and children in the ruined villages around Asmara. The sound of firing still haunts them. The Eritreans do have some claim to self-determination. They were annexed by Ethiopia in 1962. More than 600,000 Eritrean refugees can bear witness to the fighting that followed, to the late Haile Selassie's attempts to subdue the bandits as both he and the present regime in Addis Ababa call the EPLF. Legally though, the guerrillas are rebels, and as far as much of the outside world is concerned, they're a political embarrassment. It's an embarrassment that has prevented most of the recognized aid organizations from doing anything about a problem that's becoming a massive strain on the guerrillas' meager resources. Many have been sent on the guerrilla convoys to camps in the Sudan, but the bulk of them remain. As more and more towns and villages have fallen under the control of the guerrillas, so the refugees are absorbed. Some have families and friends to go to, but with 90,000 made homeless since the beginning of the year, resettlement has become an almost impossible task. They set up home where and when they can, in deserted railway sidings and in the camps abandoned by the Ethiopian army. The EPLF provide them with flour and medical help. More than 1,500,000 people were treated last year alone in their four main hospitals and by their 500 barefoot doctors. All our house, he says, all that we had was burnt during the fighting for Masawa, and now we are waiting for help and to start a new life. Some kind of a normal life does, in fact, exist for a large majority of the three million people of Eritrea. Keren, with its population of 32,000, feels the pinch of war, but in the nine months since it was taken by the EPLF, it boasts more public services than the Ethiopians can offer in Asmara. Its markets are full, and although there are serious problems of unemployment, the EPLF has at least established an efficient administration. The buses arrive and leave on time, though always at sunset because of the air raids. The tickets from the information department are bought and checked, each passenger's luggage handled with care. The people of Keren have been organized into various associations. There are work parties like these students returning from gathering wood. They're the groups that are supposed to lay the democratic foundations for the Eritrea of the future. 
It's entirely voluntary, but perhaps those on the outside feel a certain amount of social draft. But it's amongst the middle-class businessmen of places like Keren that the EPLF has had the hardest job explaining the reasons for its existence and its dreams of the future. There is price control and limited nationalization, and certainly no room in their program for profiteering. But no matter how hard the EPLF strive for normality, the war, it seems, is impossible to escape. The children of Dekamhare, encouraged as elsewhere to learn practical skills, must always be reminded of the realities of life behind the guerrilla lines. They have to build their own air raid shelters. Ethiopians, it appears, will never accept anything less than victory in Eritrea, even though more than 6,000 Ethiopian regular soldiers are now prisoners of the EPLF. The problem for the EPLF is that the Ethiopians refuse to recognize that the prisoners even exist, although the International Red Cross has already been provided with their names, addresses and ID cards. The government in Addis Ababa has bluntly refused to discuss the matter, and it appears politically impossible for the Red Cross to act independently. They are fed, clothed and given medical treatment by the guerrillas. But all that's come from the Red Cross so far has been 10,000 bars of chocolate. And even that was sent surreptitiously. But high in the hills near Asmara, that's one problem that wasn't being discussed last month at the meeting of the EPLF's political bureau and central committee. The men who over the last 16 years have emerged as the driving force behind the front. Alamin Mohamed Saeed, responsible for the front's foreign missions. Haile Mariam, in charge of education. <laughs> Mohamed Ramadan Noor, the front's general secretary. Now we know that uh, according to our intelligence, uh, we know that the Ethiopians uh, the plan of the Ethiopians that after they have changed uh, the situation in Ogaden Front, that they are planning to uh, have or to concentrate on the uh, northern uh, uh, front. But uh, it's true, uh, it may have certain uh, effect in the situation, but this does not mean that it could uh, change the whole situation uh, against our uh, 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 against our just cause. Well, does that uh, mean that as, a, as an army that you are prepared and ready to face the full force of an Ethiopian offensive with its Russian tanks, planes, artillery, perhaps even Cuban combat troops? Are you prepared to face that? Yes, we are prepared and we are well uh, uh, we are well uh, uh, prepared and ready to face uh, uh, such offensive. And you and think you could contain it? Yeah, sure. Again, that film was done by the BBC and shown originally on its Panorama program. The reporter was Simon Drain. Now for some update perspective from an American congressman with a lot of knowledge about and interest in what's happening in Eritrea and Ethiopia. He's Congressman Paul Zongas, Democrat of Massachusetts. He was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia at one time and more recently visited Ethiopia as part of a congressional fact-finding mission to the Horn of Africa. Congressman, you and your colleague on that trip, Congressman Don Bonker, mm -hmm. said in January in an, the opening sentence of your report, and I quote, Nowhere in Africa is there more potential for major instability and violence than in the Horn. And Eritrea was clearly one of the problems you had in mind, was it not? That's right. It was the obvious issue after the Ogaden. Yeah. Look, we just heard the Eritrean view of their situation. You've talked to the Ethiopians. Why do they feel so strongly that Eritrea belongs to them? 
Interestingly, during the film, the distinction between Ethiopia and Eritrea was made very clearly. To the Ethiopian mind in Addis Ababa and the rest of Ethiopia, Eritrea is perceived as a province, like Shor province or, or Desi province. The people speak Tigrinya, but there are Ethiopians who speak Galinya or Garagi, uh, that kind of thing. So it's not perceived as that different. They see them as brothers. They will never let them go. Much like a state of the Union in the United States? A good analogy. Yeah. All right, the rebel leaders, as we've heard, uh, as we just heard, uh, seem determined to, to, to fight apparently mm. to the last man, if, if necessary. Are the Ethiopians equally as determined? I think you'd have to draw a distinction between perhaps the average Ethiopian who would like to see, I feel, a kind of negotiated settlement, maybe a federation, as they had at one point, and Colonel Mengistu, who's the head of Ethiopia, who I think has a mindset that dictates a violent approach towards the problems, and I think he's going in there, and he's going to go in there and try to put them down. Well, what is the, the likely outcome of this determination on uh, the will of both sides? An awful lot of people are going to be killed? I don't see the way out. If Mengistu um, insists upon putting them down and, and bringing them back into the Ethiopian camp, if the Eritreans believe in independence, which I think they do, it's going to be an attrition bordering on genocide. It's going to be a chapter in our history in, the in the, this year and next year, which will be very sad. Thousands of people are going to die then, at on least. both sides. You know. At least. Is a negotiated settlement really just not in the cards anymore? Back in 1974, General Amman was the head of the Ethiopian government who was from Eritrea. He tried to negotiate. He was overthrown by the Durg, the junta. And at that point, when they killed him, they went into Asmara with the military and, and killed a lot of people. I think at that juncture, negotiations were out of the question, and it's going to be settled by violence. Now, you and, uh, and Congressman Bonker just today, in fact, drafted a letter uh, to the Ethiopian government pleading with them to negotiate. Uh, where does that letter stand? What do you hope to accomplish with that? I guess it's out of frustration. What do you do in this particular case? There really aren't that many options. And what we hope to do is get a number of members of Congress to sign the letter to show them and get to that the world is really looking at what happens in Eritrea. Mm -hmm. And uh, what good it will do, I don't know. Well, so far, the uh, State Department has uh, issued statements lamenting mm -hmm. what, what is happening there and what is likely to happen. Is there anything else that the U.S. really can do besides lament it? Realistically, um, no. Um, when the United States made the error of uh, not um, helping Ethiopia vis-a-vis -vis the Somali aggression, we pretty much canceled ourselves out of Ethiopia. We don't even have an ambassador there. We are in no position to have any influence on policy. Perhaps all we can do is help the Sudanese in terms of their problems and call attention to what's happening in Eritrea. Mm -hmm. But in terms of any viability, we, we just don't have it. So far, the wire reports say that there is no concrete evidence that those 17,000 Cuban troops that are in Ethiopia have actually involved in this fighting mm -hmm. in Eritrea. Is there really any way for them to avoid it down the line? I think Castro would be in a very difficult position putting his troops against what is essentially another Marxist government. It's an internal problem. Um, there are non-aligned countries like um, Algeria, Iraq, Syria who, that are putting pressure on Fidel Castro not to do this. So he's really caught in a squeeze, and he wants to be friendly with the Ethiopians, the obvious Soviet interest that's involved. But he's not going to come out of this looking good to the third world. Particularly because he's backing a, well, the, the Eritreans see themselves as, a, as an independence movement, right. and here he again he would be backing the other side. People switch sides on this very often. Yeah. Congressman, uh, this is a very uh, tragic story. There's no question about that. Uh, and there's really nothing, regardless of who's right and who's wrong, the fact is thousands of people are about to die, and there's really nothing that can be done about it. Is that what you're saying? What can be done is, um, is small things. Um, you're not going to have any kind of international intervention, clearly, because it's in, within mm -hmm. the borders of Ethiopia. Um, there's no way the Soviets are going to back down. I think it's going to be tragic. All right. Congressman, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll be back tomorrow night. I'm Jim Lehrer. Thank you and good night. For a transcript, Send $1 to the McNeil Lair Report, Box 345, New York, New York, 10019.
The McNeil Lair Report was produced by WNET and WETA. They are solely responsible for its content. Funding for this program has been provided by this station and other public television stations and by grants from Exxon Corporation, Allied Chemical Corporation, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Thank you.